I hope that I'll be able to provide some new ways of thinking about your relationship with government and in particular local government, um, your role as a citizen and what you might be able to do to transform our culture. Um, that is my goal, but I'm going to start with some background. I have to say, anytime you can make a PowerPoint presentation and include a baby photo of yourself, <laughs> you should absolutely do it because you're not going to get that many opportunities. And um, anyway, that's me. I also put, put this on here because this expression of sort of bemused confusion that like I started my life with was, was uh, replicated throughout my career, uh, both in starting the Ann Arbor Chronicle as a new business and then in this new venture, uh, starting the um, Civ City Initiative. So that's like a common expression for me. Um, so I was born in Indiana, grew up there, um, was editor of my high school newspaper, but I did not go to journalism school. Um, I uh, actually got a liberal arts degree, even though I went to Indiana University and they have a terrific journalism school. Um, I didn't really want to um, lock myself into a career path of journalism, so I got a, a super useful English and political science degree for all you uh, liberal arts undergraduates up there. Um, and that led to my first and only job in government in the Peace Corps. Uh, I, right after college, I spent two years in the Central African Republic. Um, I was teaching English uh, to students uh, as well as to um, African teachers of English. Um, after that, I went back to graduate school. I got a linguistics uh, degree, a master's degree um, in applied linguistics. Went to China for two years and a, taught at a medical university, uh, taught English to doctors uh, and nurses. Um, and my point is that all of this happened and I didn't really have a clear um, idea of where I wanted to go with my profession. And um, I'm a big fan of circuitous paths uh, and serendipity. And um, I think that the skills that I learned uh, in these early years trying to figure out what I wanted to do and doing some different things that ultimately led me to journalism and now the nonprofit sector um, served me well. Um, I, uh, I developed the ability to be um, really flexible and adaptable um, to whatever came my way. Um, had a general curiosity about the world, which I think is an asset in almost every profession. Um, I was able to uh, handle stress, which uh, I discovered a little bit later I wasn't uh, as able to handle it as I thought I could, but um, I was able to go through some experiences that were very stressful, but I was able to kind of come up with um, uh, strategies for dealing with them. I developed uh, an ability to communicate that was really critical um, in some of these ventures that I launched subsequently. Um, so I came back from China, took a job um, at the Rochester Business Journal. They were basically hiring anybody at the time. <laughs> they hired me as a business reporter covering technology, although I had not studied business and I knew very little about technology. Um, the point is that uh, these are skills that you can learn and I think that particularly in journalism, um, you can uh, approach it as a, um, an apprenticeship when you get your first jobs. I don't know how many of you are interested in that field, um, but it is uh, something that, that I found was um, dependent on writing skills and the curiosity that I mentioned earlier, much more so than the traditional training that a lot of journalists go through. So I worked for four years uh, in Rochester, New York, and leveraged that job to join the Ann Arbor News in 1996. Um, I had never been to Ann Arbor before. Uh, it was uh, quite a shock. I, I likened it to other smaller uh, college towns I had been in, and it was um, much more than that. Um, it's a beautiful city, although I did not expect to stay here. I viewed this as sort of a um, stop uh, on a transition to larger cities. I was interested in Chicago and St. Louis um, and other larger Midwestern cities um, before I came here. But I discovered, uh, as many of you have, the attributes of this town where you have the small town character, but a lot of the big city amenities. So I started here um, at the Ann Arbor News, and I call it the original Ann Arbor News. This is before the sort of closing of it that, and the um, resurrection that came many years later. Um, at that time, it's kind of incredible to think about now, but the business desk and the newspaper in general were expanding their staff. 
Um, they brought me in as a third business reporter on a business staff that was growing. And they brought me in to be the first uh, reporter to cover technology. Now, at that time, the tech sector was thriving. Um, this was before the dot-com bust. And um, as an example of the disconnect between the newspaper industry and the tech sector or even the general public, when I came uh, to the Ann Arbor News in 1996, there was only one computer in the newsroom that connected to the internet for all of the reporting staff. And that was a dial-up connection through AOL. <laughs> so um, I, I, as a tech reporter, was asked to do my business cards. And um, I, had, I had no email address. None of us had email addresses. So I had to use my own personal email address on my business card. Um, which was also an AOL account. So it was just a, a humiliating year or so before uh, we actually got up to speed and at least had our own email. Um, and uh, I, I think that that sort of lag is um, something that led to uh, the troubles that the um, newspaper industry later suffered. And I know there are some of you here, former colleagues, uh, that have lived through that experience. And um, it, was very, it was very sad to see. Um, so I served some years as a business reporter. Um, I then covered the university for um, a hot second, uh, probably about a year, and then was promoted to business editor uh, and eventually became opinion editor, where I oversaw the editorial pages, um, wrote editorials, uh, although I will say that I was not on the watch when uh, the newspaper endorsed George Bush. Just for the record, I always like to throw it out there because somebody gets the wrong idea and I uh, want to clarify that. So um, one of the things that I uh, am most proud of as my, uh, on the opinion desk was my ability to include more um, voices from local residents. Uh, when I first took over the pages, we had one um, reader contributed essay per week on a Sunday. And I was able to, by the time I left, have um, at least uh, one essay a day, so five days a week. And we didn't publish p editorial pages on Saturday, but um, on Sunday and weekdays. Um, and we really expanded that. Um, I felt like it was important to have as many different local voices as possible. Um, generally, the newspaper was oriented towards wire opinion pieces by the likes of George Will or others from the New York Times Syndicate or Washington Post. And I felt like as a local newspaper, we had a responsibility to really reach out and um, provide a platform for um, our local residents to, to have their say. Um, so I was, I was proud of that. Um, but around this time, this was the mid-2000s, um, things were starting to implode in the newspaper industry. This is one of many charts you can find. Um, that shows the dramatic decline um, in advertising revenue for, um, for the newspaper industry. Um, it doesn't go up past uh, 2012, but the, the decline um, is, uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not rebounding to the extent, and I think that there's a general agreement in the profession that we will never see the heights of revenue that um, newspapers once enjoyed. Um, but I think worse than the, the revenue decline, and part of that was attributed to the declining economy, but worse than that was the inability of the leaders um, at individual newspapers or, or newspaper conglomerates to respond effectively to the, commit, um, to the competitive challenges that they faced. Craigslist came in and basically de decimated um, classified advertising, for example. Yet, um, Newspapers uh, were very slow to respond with their own online products. Um, the Ann Arbor News was no different. Um, and in fact, we had even uh, a, an extra challenge in that our ownership, which was out of New York, created a separate entity to run the websites for all of the um, papers that were owned by this company in Michigan. So the Ann Arbor News had no control over its really crappy website. <laughs> um, it was uh, uniformly uh, uh, loathed within the newsroom and in the community, uh, yet we were responsible, and we were viewed as being responsible for it, and so it was a very difficult position. And 
and one that I think um, really undermined the long-term um, success of the um, Ann Arbor News to transition to this new world that we live in now. So, I, so things were going, um, things were difficult on the business side. Um, there were buyouts, uh, we were shrinking through attrition, and it was just a very demoralizing place to work. Um, I think for all of us, uh, it, it was not a place where there was vision. You didn't feel like the leadership knew where they were going. And that's a very difficult environment in which to work. Even if things were really bad, I think that if the staff had understood that we were, gonna, we were in this together and we were really gonna go towards this vision that we had and, and this, is gonna how, this is gonna be how we approached it and we had a strategy, I think that would have been a very different environment, but it was not that way. And um, so a lot of us started looking around for what other things we might be able to do. And for me, I had an epiphan epiphany in 2007 when I went to a journalism conference in DC. And there was a panel discussion uh, by what they called new media entrepreneurs. These are people who, some of them had journalism backgrounds, some of them didn't, but they um, had all started their own online news sites. And, and listening to them talk, and then afterwards going and looking at what they were doing, um, some of, there was some creativity, but a lot of it was not particularly well done, but they were pioneers. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, I could actually do that, and I think I could do that in, an Ar in Ann Arbor, and I think I could do a better job than what's out there already in a different way. And that planted a seed, um, that didn't, uh, it didn't Im immediately go home and quit my job. Um, but a year later, um, I sort of worked up the energy to do that and, and the, the gumption. Um, it is uh, probably one of the most frightening things I ever did um, to quit my job. At that time, there was, um, certainly the newspaper was struggling, but there was no indication at all that um, the Ann Arbor News would be closed. Uh, there was, um, certainly a sense that we were in for a difficult time. But people thought I was crazy. Uh, they thought that I was giving up a good paying job and benefits for a completely uncertain future with no promise of success and no one locally who had really gone out and done something like this. Um, I think that speaks more to my serious dissatisfaction with the way things were running more so than my deep desire to be an entrepreneur, frankly. Um, and I'm not sure that's probably the best motivation. But um, I really wanted to do work that I could feel proud of. I wanted to be in a position where I could talk to people in the community and get excited about what I was doing again. And it had been um, a long time since I had felt that way. Um, we launched in September 2008, which was uh, pretty much the bottom of, see, people are laughing. <laughs> you live through it. Uh, I, if I could go back in time, I would say to myself back then, you know, just get a job at the university. <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> It'll be much easier. Um, but of course, we didn't know at the time that that was what was happening and we knew things were bad, but that was a time when advertising was contracting even more and so businesses that were struggling in that environment um, were having a very difficult time and they were cutting back on advertising with the Ann Arbor News and the Ann Arbor Observer and some of the more traditional papers. Um, yet nobody thought that the Ann Arbor News would close. I mean, it was over a 170 year old institution. So, the thought that it would close was just beyond uh, anyone's imagination, at least no one that I talked to, and I talked to a lot of people. Um, I had never been in business, um, and no one in my family uh, had ever been in business either, so I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, my partner and husband uh, and editor of the Chronicle, Dave Askins, same thing. Um, his experience consisted of uh, a um, multi-year uh, website called Teeter Talk, where he would interview um, people from the community on uh, Teeter Totter in our backyard <laughs> that he had actually built for our 15th wedding anniversary. You know, the metaphor of marriage, you've got two people to do it, it's ups and downs, if one gets off, the other falls off. So he, um, he did uh, dozens of interviews uh, with on the Teeter Totter, and he put the transcripts up um, online with a picture of the person at the other end of the totter. And um, 
But he also brought with him um, a really sharp mind and a curiosity about how things worked and an ability to write. And I think those were the things that really um, allowed him to transition into this, this new enterprise that we did. Um, so we started the Ann Arbor Chronicle in September 2008. We decided to focus on local government. I think this is another reason why people thought we were just out of our minds when we, when we first launched. Um, we felt like focusing on local government and civic issues was a way that we could bring value to the community and differentiate ourselves from the more traditional media, um, in this case, the, the Detroit papers, but uh, more so the Ann Arbor News and um, the Ann Arbor Observer. There are so many entities that you pay taxes to as an Ann Arbor resident that get scant coverage even to this day, but that, that get, even at that time, received very little attention. Um, it was viewed as boring and uh, unimportant. And that was the work that we picked up. So we started going to local government meetings, the City Council, Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners, the Ann Arbor District Library, School Board, smaller entities that um, still uh, have oversight over tax dollars like the um, Ann Arbor DDA, the Ann Arbor um, Public Transit Authority, and several others. We also covered um, a lot of advisory groups uh, where early discussions of some of the decisions that the elected officials would later make um, started. So the Planning Commission, Greenbelt Advisory Commission, Park Advisory Commission, and, and many others. Um, and let me just say that no one was clamoring for 15,000 word reports on uh, city council meetings. Uh, this was not uh, something that uh, people were coming up to us and saying, we really need you to do this. Actually, people were approaching us and saying, can you co cover the sports? Can you cover high school sports? Or how about having some comics? Or you know, all of the things that they wanted out of a traditional paper. And we just didn't feel like that was a possibility. Our site now is archived by the Ann Arbor District Library. Eli Nyberger, the deputy um, director, is here today. And, and that is, uh, we were forever grateful to the library um, for doing that for us. Uh, it is transparent um, to the user. You'll go to our site, and it looks like our site. There's a very small tagline um, at the top that indicates that it's archived by AADL. Um, so that is huge, and that allowed the word count uh, on the spot. Um, so I, it might be a good time to um, also talk about why we incorporated as an LLC um, for the Chronicle. And I think that, that uh, the vision is one um, main reason why we felt that it was better to do an LLC than a nonprofit. Um, going through the nonprofit process, which is what I'm doing right now, uh, is very complex. Uh, you need a board of directors who share your vision, and that's a very important thing, um, that kind of support, uh, the foundational support. I don't know that I could have found um, people in Ann Arbor who would have bought into what we were trying to do at that time. After we've been doing it for a while, I think people got understood. But when you're trying to explain it and it doesn't exist yet, it's a very difficult thing. And people use their frame of reference for what they already know. And so they're trying to overlay that frame of reference on what you're telling them. And it, and it, was, um, it was really difficult in those first couple of years um, to, to get our vision uh, communicated effectively. And I think that if, you had, if we had gone down the route of forming a nonprofit, we would have struck a barrier pretty quickly where our board would have tried to give us direction that we probably would have disagreed with. Um, there's also a, a whole other layer of complexity in terms of employees versus um, members. So as an LLC, um, Dave and I were members. So we were not employees, we were owners. Uh, when we paid ourselves, we just did member draw. So you didn't have the layer of um, uh, withholdings, uh, tax filings uh, related to having employees, um, workers' comp payments, and all of that. It was uh, a decision that um, a lot of people questioned at the time because there was a sense that, oh, you should just be a nonprofit and people will just give you more money because it's tax deductible. I sort of uh, question that premise, um, especially now that I'm actually forming a nonprofit and you know seeing how, how much of that is true. Um, but there are those are the kinds of things that we were weighing at the time and ultimately decided to do um, an LLC, and, and I think that worked out um, pretty well. But 
saying that, it, it, it was still um, really a, a total crapshoot. Um, as I said, it was the most frightening thing that I have ever done in my life. Um, I have nothing but the deepest respect for um, entrepreneurs. Uh, I think that it is just, uh, 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 especially the first time, uh, you, you really don't know what you're getting into unless you've seen it growing up and your family's done it. I think it's, um, it's just a, a, a very difficult lifestyle, um, but it has a lot of benefits and advantages, and, and it was a lot of fun in a lot of ways, too. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't all struggle. Um, I think if the economy had been in a little different shape, um, we would have had a very different experience, but you know, that's what happened. Uh, so we struggled those first couple of years, but we were not the only uh, ones that struggled. You all know, uh, two, 2009, um, the Ann Arbor News uh, announced that it was closing, uh, the, closing the business completely in order to relaunch uh, a new entity called AnnArbor.com. Uh, I remember getting a call from Tony Deering, who was in charge at the time, um, and he actually offered me a job, and uh, I mean, I just laughed at him. I, my response was so uh, visceral uh, that it was a it, it was a whole level uh, ruder than I typically am. But um, <laughs> but but anyway, so there is that. So when I left the news, uh, I had a lot of friends there, and um, I talked a little bit about the leadership and really felt like um, there could have been a different path. The Ann Arbor News went down. Um, I felt like they were using Ann Arbor as an experiment to cut their legacy costs. And, and so you, it, you've seen this play out in other um, advanced publication newspapers con countrywide where they'll close the business so everybody is fired, laid off, and then they'll interview a select few for a much um, smaller staff. And typically the hires there were younger, fresh out of, college or have just a couple years experience. So most of the older veteran journalists or people who were um, in other departments didn't get rehired. Um, so there was a lot of bitterness there. Um, and I also felt like uh, they, weren't, they weren't making decisions based on what the community needed or wanted, but they were trying to sell it that way. Ann Arbor News decided to close, but by that time, we were feeling a little bit better. We were starting to make some money. I will never forget the elation of selling my first ad. Uh, it was just like, it was, it was like a miracle. It was, it was phenomenal to me that anyone would pay money to support us. I mean, I know that's what the model is, but even so, you know, you really feel um, it, it's a very personal thing when it's your business. Um, and so uh, I have a lot of um, loyalty to our locally owned businesses because those are the people, the, the locally owned businesses and organizations are the ones that took a risk, took a chance on us, um, supported us financially through ads, but understanding that you know, we were not gonna be able to deliver the click-through bait that um, other publications were. It was not that kind of a publication. We ended up having around 30 to 40,000 um, unique viewers each month. But at the early days in particular, you know, they were not getting a, a ton of views um, for their money, but they didn't care. They supported what we were doing. They believed in what we were doing. These are just some examples um, of uh, some of the, the local businesses. Um, institutions like the Ann Arbor District Library, again, uh, were supporters from, from near the start. Um, and, and that was huge, uh, in, in large part, because of morale, um, but also because we didn't end up eating cat food and you know sleeping on somebody's front porch. Um, but it's interesting, and, and I talk about the ability to pivot and be flexible. Um, we didn't start out with a subscription model at all when we first started. Um, we uh, were approached by a reader who said, you know, I gave a subscription to the Ann Arbor News at, and AnnArbor.com at that time, and actually this is before .com, so Ann Arbor News. And I'd like to give. I'd like to subscribe for you to you too, and we had never considered that possibility. We quickly said yes. We will figure out a way for your, you to give us your money, <laughs> and um, we put up a, a PayPal donate button um, with a lot of verbiage saying we are not a nonprofit, so this donate button is really your subscription button. Um, 
but by the end of our run, our six year run, um, about 40% of our uh, revenues were from subscribers who we didn't have a paywall. Everything was available to anyone who came to our website. But these are people who believed in what we were doing and just wanted to support our work. Um, and that was huge. Um, we uh, capitalized on that uh, by, by highlighting the fact that um, they were supporting individuals in the community. Um, these are caricatures done by a former Ann Arbor News um, artist, uh, Tammy Graves. And uh, I, she, I'm much, she makes me seem more well endowed there, and I appreciate that in her <laughs> interview. But we, um, so we, we were, we were fairly well known um, in the community, and we thought that that was um, a, an asset, uh, particularly since there were even less ties to the traditional newspaper, as some of the um, older reporters uh, were let go. Um, but I think that our ability to recognize that there was another opportunity for revenue and, and pivot pretty quickly was something that uh, larger corporations um, are, are not able to do. And I think it's a really useful skill um, to have as an entrepreneur. Um, community support was crucial uh, throughout. These were mailers that we had that are still on my refrigerator, my little Whirlpool refrigerator. But um, Zingerman's co-founder, um, Paul Saginaw, Laura Rubin uh, of the uh, Huron River Watershed Council, Trevor Staples, who's a local school teacher, but um, basically got the Ann Arbor Skate Park off the ground and built. Um, they endorsed us. Uh, we had mailers that we sent out to um, people that we were asking for support. Um, and that was huge. And that was all very grounded in our local community. Um, so we ran the Chronicle for six years. And uh, on our sixth anniversary, which was also our 25th wedding anniversary, um, we closed. We uh, had announced it earlier in the year. Um, there were a lot of different reasons for doing that, but the primary reason was we were exhausted. We were totally spent. We had given six years of um, working, uh, you know, nonstop. Uh, people questioned that, um, and I can tell you that uh, now that I'm back into a more normal sort of routine of work and life that I look back on that period and think, we, we really did. I mean, we got up in the morning and we started talking about the Chronicle and we went out and we were doing Chronicle and the weekends and the evenings, the city council meetings that ran until, you know, two or three in the morning. Um, it was pretty brutal. We knew that we could have changed our model um, and uh, lightened our load and um, done things to bring in more revenue. and it, as we talked through our options, that just wasn't the kind of publication that we wanted to have. So it was a, it was a complicated decision, um, a lot of factors, but um, ultimately we wanted to uh, close it in a planful way that wasn't um, out of desperation. Uh, and I think that we were able to achieve that and I'm really proud of those six years and I'm proud of um, our ability to, to actually make the decision of when to stop, I think, for a lot of particularly small businesses, that's a really hard thing to do because it's your life. And there's, a, there's an element of, um, oh, you didn't make a success of it. You were a failure because you couldn't keep it going. And I just don't, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think you, you do what you can for as long as you can and, and, and listen to yourself and trust yourself um, when it's time to stop. I think that's an important lesson for entrepreneurs. So. Um, after uh, closing the Chronicle, drank a lot of Manhattans, um, binge watched Damages on Netflix, all seven seasons. Um, and then we started thinking about what we wanted to do next. Um, one of our goals with the Chronicle was to try to um, lower the barriers to entry for people who were interested in local government. And we thought we could do that by providing a lot of information about how government decisions are made. Um, you could read, if you read what we had reported, you would be as up to speed on any local issue, and in some cases more up to speed than the elected officials who were making the decisions. So we felt like that was um, an important uh, thing to provide the community. But we didn't do a lot of outreach with that. We didn't evangelize about the importance of civic engagement. So as we looked at what we wanted to do next, that was one of the things that, that emerged. We felt like 
Um, there was an opportunity to do something in Ann Arbor where we live that could create a very dramatic change. Part of it was identifying the problem, and I think um, one of the things from our experience at the Chronicle uh, is revealed to us is that our democracy um, is not healthy, and I think that's uh, not necessarily a starting revelation to um, most people, but it was, it was very clear um, especially if you look at um, voter turnout as a metric. Ann Arbor likes to think of itself as a very intelligent and engaged town, but the um, 2014 mayoral primary, which is when those decisions are made in this town, they aren't challenged, there aren't serious challengers in November. The Democratic primary, there were less than 15,000 votes cast, and it was a four-way race, so it was very competitive, high-profile race, but that's the amount of turnout that, that um, it resulted in. And I think for you know, a city over 114,000 residents, that's, that's just, you can't be proud of that. You can't think that that's okay. Um, so we decided to, to look at that and what might we be able to do um, in that space. We looked at uh, why people weren't voting. And th these, uh, these numbers actually from 2012, and I just recently, um, was given them uh, by a, um, an Eastern Michigan University professor whose student had done some research, but um, they took a sampling of 20,000, about 20,000 non-voters, and these are the top reasons why they were um, not voting. Too busy, conflict of interest, not interested, um, illness and disability, didn't like the candidates, out of town. There were some others uh, lesser. My, my favorite one is forgot, so like 4%. <laughs> So, so we looked at these things and we thought, you know, it's doable to, to crack this. These are not reasons that are um, uh, intractable. These are not problems that are intractable. So, um, so uh, the, other, the other issue that we've heard uh, anecdotally, um, in addition to some of these, is that it's called the free rider sy syndrome. So people who are okay with how things are going, so they're, you know, Ann Arbor is a beautiful town. I love Ann Arbor. It seems to be doing just fine. Somebody's taking care of it. <laughs> we'll just let them continue taking care of it. And so you sort of um, give over your own responsibility uh, as a citizen and resident to the people who are already engaged. Um, and I would say probably maybe 200 or so people um, are really in the trenches, uh, understand what's going on, influencing or making decisions themselves. And that's a very small number. But a lot of people are willing to say, you know, that, that's fine, we'll, we'll just go with that. Um, and I, I, I guess I just, I don't agree with that. I also think there's more to being a citizen than just voting. Um, being a citizen also means understanding how your local government works and how you can contribute to civic life yourself. Um, it means understanding that politics is part of the process, but politics does not equal governance, and it's possible to separate the two. Um, and I think that's difficult for a lot of people to really understand or accept, um, particularly in our national climate of very divisive um, partisan politics. So we said, well, what's the solution to this? And I really need to get a better image because uh, I'm trying to do like the healing metaphor. <laughs> this kind of doesn't quite capture that. But um, So if you accept the premise that our democracy is sick, then you start doing some diagnostics and start looking for a cure. Um, and, and I think the fundamental question is um, whether it's even possible to make a difference to heal that corrosive rhetoric that we all have seen um, and perhaps engaged in, and to eliminate the disgust that a lot of people have when they talk about government. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've had conversations and people are almost like physically start walking away when they hear me talk about lo local government because they just associate it with corrupt politicians and um, you know, political views that they don't agree with. And a lot of that's shaped by our national rhetoric. I've come to believe that we have the best chance of changing that or turning that around if we focus on the local level. I think that there's a better chance to understand how the local government works and to actually influence decisions 
and meet with the people who are making those decisions and perhaps even be a decision maker yourself at the local level. So we're focused on the local level for those reasons. It, it's possible to really participate in a meaningful way here, but I don't think that it's um, a foregone conclusion that we can do it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's possible to really shift our culture, but that's the question that we're asking. Is it possible to shift the culture around our political engagement and our local government? Um, is, it, is it possible to educate and inform and cajole the majority of residents, perhaps all residents, into caring what happens at City Hall? Um, is it possible to make Ann Arbor a model of civic engagement that can be replicated across the country in different communities nationwide? That's what we created Civ City Initiative to do, to try to do. I believe it's possible to shift our culture in a positive way, or I wouldn't be doing this. Um, but I do think you need to start at the local level and ultimately transform our dialogue here and at the state and at the national level. But we need to embrace the fact that it means more than just voting. Um, democracy in general relies on more than just your vote. And I think that it's an easy thing to measure and it's something that we obviously will be measuring. But there's so much more it, to being a citizen um, and to, be, to making a meaningful contribution than just showing up on election day. So we ask how we might do this. And this is an awesome graphic that um, one of the designers at the Ann Arbor District Library did for a uh, night news challenge grant. Which one of the librarians. One of the librarians wow. who is a gifted artist. Um, we didn't get the grant, but, <laughs> but, but I love this and I will use this as much as possible because I think it captures sort of the, the vibe that we're trying to go for. Um, there is not a single solution to this problem. There is no silver bullet. You know, it's not an app. It's not one program or one service or one thing. Um, it's a saturation. And I think that that is going to be the key to our success, if we can achieve success, is that we are going to saturate this community with opportunities to engage. Um, we're going to infuse the community with dozens of possibilities for you to participate or learn um, or inform someone else. Um, my vision is that on any given day, every day, as you move through your daily routines, you are going to encounter these kind of opportunities in your daily life. So for example, maybe there's a sign at your local coffee shop that gives highlights from a recent city council agenda or actions coming out of city council. And maybe every coffee shop has that same sign. So wherever you go, you see that same information being conveyed. Um, maybe you sign up for a civic quiz an Ann Arbor local civic quiz on Twitter. And you play it, and you actually see people giving answers, and you understand why some are wrong and some, some are right. Um, maybe your kid comes home for school, from school and asks you to adopt a storm drain. That's part of the civic infrastructure. Um, someone in your book club organizes a cleanup crew for your neighborhood park. A coworker tells you about a new development in the works nearby, and you attend a planning commission meeting because you know you can give public commentary and tell people your, opi uh, your opinion. Um, maybe you attend a happy hour with local elected officials. There are so many ways that we can create this kind of saturation effect, and there are ways that are not particularly difficult. I mean, there are things that you can do that are very practical that you, as school information students, can do. For example, an app for your um, smartphone where you enter the hours that you have to volunteer each week, you enter the types of topics you're interested in, and then you get a list of volunteer opportunities in your county or city um, that you can then sign up for online. That's one example. It's not the cure, but it's one thing we can do. Maybe you just happen to walk by Liberty Plaza and you see a puppet show reenactment of uh, highlights from a city council meeting. It doesn't, it doesn't all have to be you know, a learning opportunity. Because I think this is something that is very doable and very doable by you, know, you folks. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain amount of whimsy that can, um, that can happen too. Not to particularly uh, say that this is the answer again, but that um, you know, it's one more way that you'll, you'll encounter something related to local government and you'll think about it and it might drive you to um, actually take some action in your own life. It's a cumulative effect. It's all of these things together um, that's going to make a difference. I want civic life to be so ingrained into our everyday experiences that we don't think of it as something special. We don't think of it as an unusual thing to go to a public meeting or speak during public commentary or know who your city council representatives are. That's just normal. And I think that that can affect our quality of life and create a reputation for this city that will be um, aston astonishing, actually, to most other folks in the country. That's my vision. Um, now we sort of get into the very uh, mundane tasks of uh, achieving that, which starts with foundational documentation. We uh, filed for our 501c3 status. Um, we are waiting for that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, another nonprofit that's established here called A2 Geeks, Who's heard of A2 Geeks? Yes. They are terrific. They are our fiscal sponsor, which allows our donors to get tax deductions. Um, it's huge because they're a volunteer organization and they're passing through 100% to us. So they're not taking a charge off the top um, to process the donations. It's, it's amazing. It's another sign of support uh, that was just huge to us in our early days. Um, well, our early, early days. Um, we're, we've started a board. Um, one of my board members is oh, Ingrid Sheldon. Yay, Ingrid. Um, former uh, Ann Arbor mayor uh, is on the board. Uh, it's a very small board, but it is a, a diverse board. That was very important uh, to, to us. We've passed bylaws. We've gotten our Michigan solicitation license, which allows us to get donation, to solicit donations from the general public. So all of these things are sort of being put in place. Um, at the same time, we're doing some programmatic uh, early stage development. I'm taking an inventory of existing efforts because there's a lot going on um, in different corners of the community, but it's not sort of brought together in a coherent way. We are not in it, interested in reinventing uh, all of these, these things or having Civ City hold all of these programs and services or activities. But we're interested in amplifying, supporting, um, promoting things that already exist. So part of what I'm doing is trying to find out what, what is happening out there now. Um, we're also identifying willing partners who are going to be able to help us um, with new programs and services. Um, some of those people include, organizations include the um, public schools, the Ann Arbor District Library again, um, League of Women Voters, uh, other organizations that we're talking to, to identify things and really just plant seeds to see what might come out of um, their sort of brains of their organization. Um, we're also, have launched or starting to launch some pilot projects this year, even though um, we're still very, very young as an organization. Um, there is a Twitter account called A2 Civ City, um, which is uh, every day posting uh, information about public meetings uh, during the day. So um, today was Tuesday, so we had a planning commission announcement with the agenda, in agenda included. Um, and a couple of others, which now I just can't recall because I'm that, I'm that old. So the Civ City ticker uh, Twitter feed is up. We're talking with Washtenaw Literacy about how might we provide some information for low literacy adults about local government activity. So they could use that as material to teach how to read, but it would also at the same time be providing some sort of civic information to a, to a fairly disenfranchised part of our, our population. Um, we're going to organize some pre-election potlucks. These are essentially house parties where the people who come do some research in advance on candidates and then they share information over um, dinner and drinks. Very informal, but a way to sort of cluster the um, learning information about a, an upcoming election. Um, we're partnering with the Ann Arbor District Library and their amazing summer game. Um, it is a, it, it's a powerful thing, and I hope if you're not familiar with it, you'll, um, the website is 
play play at aadl.org. Um, we're going to have a Civ City series. Um, so all of the activities will be somehow related to um, civic activity, uh, public speaking at a, um, at a public meeting, for example, giving com commentary at city council. Um, things along those lines, we're still developing that, but that will be part of the um, Ann Arbor District Library Summer Game. Um, talking to uh, companies and trying to get information in company newsletters, um, had a conversation with the folks at Zingerman's because they distribute very widely. If we can get some information about upcoming elections, volunteer opportunities, other things that are important in the community and our civic life and local government actions, um, that could be very powerful too. So we have um, a lot of things in the works. These are some of the, the early uh, programs and services that we're hoping to get going. But we still face a lot of challenges, not least uh, among them um, cynicism and apathy. Uh, the fist cr crushing the apathy, um, the word apathy uh, is, really does reflect what we're trying to do and that's a very tough nut to crack um, to convince people that it's worthwhile to care. Um, we are also struggling in the current political climate um, and I've mentioned this several times where there's such a divisive uh, rhetoric that it's hard to get people of different political persuasions to talk to each other in a meaningful way. So we're trying to figure out how we can do that. Um, and uh, you know, funding is gonna be a challenge. Resources and again, I say funding. So that I think is for a nonprofit of any type um, and I think is uh, something that is uh, new in concept. Uh, we have to prove ourselves and, um, and we'll be doing that and we're willing to, um, to invest uh, in, in getting that done in these early stages. And honestly, I don't know if all of this will work. Um, I think that uh, our country is at a crossroads and we have a decision that we can make as citizens to give up and accept the status quo or worse, or we can try to do something different. And I am not ready to give up yet and I hope you're not either.